Is there even such a thing as a genealogy mysteries genre? Today's guest proves there is, and that you can make a full-time living writing it. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head to England to talk to genealogy mystery writer Nathan Dylan Goodwin. Nathan is the author of several nonfiction works and eight Morton Ferrier mystery novels. Nathan, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. You are the first mystery writer that I have ever interviewed. Oh, wow. I, I think it's going to be a real treat for our audience. One thing I'm curious about if I'm not mistaken, you were a teacher before you became a genealogy mystery writer. Why did you make the change from teaching to writing? Yes, you're correct. I basically, I did, before I was a teacher, I did a master's degree in creative writing. And it was kind of during that time that my mystery writing first came about. But basically, I then finished the master's and thought, oh, I don't know quite what to do (laughs) with myself. So I then qualified to be a primary school teacher. And I went and did that. And I really loved it. We enjoyed it. Very happy time for about five years. And then I kind of was getting the urge to to be able to write again. And uh, it didn't quite fit with teaching full time. But I started to do it at really early, stupid o'clock in the morning. I I used to get up at about five o'clock in the morning. And I would do an hour's writing, polishing the, this uh, story that I'd started back in my uh, master's degree and working on it for an hour before school. And then I'd go off and do a full day's uh, teaching and then um, fall asleep very, very quickly <laughs> after getting home. I, I, I guess it was just this passion to, to be able to write. That kind of took off very slowly. And I was able to go part time to do teaching part time and writing part time. And then uh, kind of took the jump and made the leap and uh, stopped teaching altogether to concentrate on writing. It was a bit of a gamble, but it paid off. So when you were doing your master's, that's when you first came up with Morton Ferrier, right, as your main character? Yes, that's right. Yes. It was at the time, it was about 2007 to 2009, I did it uh, part time. And it was kind of the rise of genealogy as a kind of more mainstream hobby and pastime and it was when um who do you think you are was on the television and people who previously hadn't been particularly interested in genealogy were kind of going okay i'm i'm interested now and i thought on this course this writing course we basically had to come up with our own stories obviously and and i thought it would be interesting to have a detective style book but where the main character uh, was actually a genealogist and so it basically had to solve a crime that's occurred in the past but rather than using traditional police uh, methods, actually used genealogy and real genealogical records. And that's where, yeah, Morton Farrier, the main character, was was born. So did you complete your first book, more or less, when you were in your master's program? I think calling it a book would be a bit of a stretch. It was basically a very, very, very rough first draft. And so I would submit the, like the first few chapters to my colleagues on the course, and they, they were very enthusiastic about it and said, yeah, keep writing it. And so I then would submit the second chapter and the third. And so by the end of the course, at the end of the two years, I had a, a very rough first draft. And it was that that I went to, on to polish when I was doing my teaching, getting, getting up really early to polish it and make it needed a lot of work and lots of editing and to, to get it ready. So it's quite a, a long road. But yes, it had start that was the, the first book that started on the on the course. So what do you think it was that caused that five year gap? Was it fear? Was it doubt? Was it just you felt like you needed to get down to making a, a paycheck because that's what you've always thought that you know, that's what people do? What was it that kept you from writing? Yeah, kind of a mixture of all those things, really. I've always loved writing, but I I never really thought that I would be able to make a living from it, you know, writing full time, particularly not with the kind of things that would have interested me, i.e. 
genealogical crime mysteries that didn't exist. So I thought, well, there's no way I can uh, make this a living. It, it went on the back burner and um, I then, yeah, w- went teaching. But then it was actually, I came upon another author called Steve Robinson and I just happened upon his book, his first book, which was a genealogical crime mystery. And I thought, wow, these these exist. <laughs> it is a genre. It's, it's out there. People are reading it. And I, I contacted him. And he said, yes, he's, he does it now full time and it's been a slow process. And he basically gave me some advice. And, and so I thought, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. Clearly, if, if there are, is a market out there for it, I'm going to try it. So I did. <laughs> so how did you make the decision to stop getting up at the crack of dawn to do your writing <laughs> and to, to, to toss over your teaching position and, and focus on writing full time? So it was quite a, a long process, really. It wasn't an overnight thing. So once I had got the book to a point where I thought, I'm happy with this to, to be released and for people to read it, I did so and did it through a self-publishing route. And it was obviously it's the first book and I, I didn't know the market. I didn't know who was out there wanting to read it. And so it was quite a slow journey, first of all. And so I, I, I definitely at the beginning, I couldn't have stopped teaching even if I wanted to I needed the, you know the paycheck so I kept going but I did keep getting up at five o'clock in the morning and basically started to work on the second book in the series so Morton's next adventure basically and that was then released and kind of I don't know if it's having had more than one out but it just there's a bit of momentum behind it and the sales were increasing of the two books and so then I made the decision, and it was a bit risky at the time, I made the decision to, to go part-time. So instead of working five days a week teaching, I dropped to two days a week teaching to give me this time for writing. So it was a, it was a slow process. And then there was another year of teaching part-time before January the 1st, I made the decision, like a, a New Year's resolution type of thing. I, I handed in my resignation, I think that was 2015 ready for the Easter break. So the Easter break came, that's when I, I stopped teaching at all and uh, was just concentrating on writing full time. It was, it was a bit of a gamble because it could have, you know, gone backwards. But I, I kind of thought, if necessary, I can return to teaching. This isn't a job that once you step out of it, you quickly, you know, you lose your, your skills and your ability. I thought, if I, if I, if I have to, I can, can go back to, to teaching. So Fortunately, I uh, so far, <laughs> touch wood, I haven't had to go back to teaching. Since it was a bit of a gamble, did you have any strategies? Did you create a plan for how you could do the best that you possibly could to make it work? I didn't really have a plan, but I was very self-motivated because I just thought as much as I enjoyed teaching and being with the kids and I had really lovely colleagues, there was kind of an increase at that time as well in bureaucracy in schools and it was just more and more and more paperwork and more and more work to be honest I didn't want to go back <laughs> to, to that and I just loved love love I love genealogy love writing and to be able to do the two it didn't take anything for me to get out of bed in the morning to get on with my work so I didn't have a plan as such but I was very much focused and committed <laughs> that this has got to work so that I don't have to go back to teaching you know I, I never had even obviously working from home I never had that, uh, I'm not going to bother today, I'll just have a day off. I was very focused and committed and just thought I need to get the next book out in the series so that there is a series there because two books doesn't really you know, make a series. So I then set to work straight away on the next one. As you were transitioning from you know, writing part-time to going full-time as a writer, was there any point, I can hear the passion in your in your voice now when it comes to writing, and I can feel that you loved it. So was there a moment where you kind of hit your groove and you just felt like, yes, this is, I can do this, and it just or sort of all clicked? How did you know when that happened? How did it feel? I think it was actually the, the first day that, so when the Easter break finished, and I would have been going back to school to teach, and I wasn't. I just woke up and I was just so excited. <laughs> I was like, like a little child on Christmas Day. I was really like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm... It was a bit unreal, really. It was like a dream a dream job. And so I got stuck straight into it. And I thought, you know, it, it happened very quickly, actually, that I got into my groove. And I thought, yeah, I still obviously didn't know until it, it took a while then to get that book out. And then it started to, you know, get good reviews. And people were saying, yes, I like your book. 
your it's a really interesting story so I thought yeah this is this is good this is going in the right direction the response to your first book really strongly contributed to your desire to take the risk and to keep going in that direction yes exactly yeah I mean I didn't know I obviously would have hoped that genealogists would have been the readers but I thought I don't know who actually this book is going to appeal to as I say I did contact another author in that genre but I say it's a genre it's kind of a sub-genre it's not there's still now aren't that many of us in it so it was hard to know who would be reading the book but predominantly it is genealogists yeah I've had very good feedback from, from the beginning of people that enjoy the uh, the mystery aspect of it and also the fact that it's real genealogy you know whatever Morton Farrier does in the books, particularly as they went on, I, you know, kind of needed to feel my way through. So it kind of the, the real records and the real history comes through more and more as the series goes on, as I've been more confident, I suppose, to, to do that. But everything that Morton does in the books with genealogy and trying to solve this crime in the past, I do first. So if he has to go to a churchyard, if he has to go to a record office, I do that. I order the records that he's going to order. The process is the same. If it's not online, then and he has to go to a record office. That's what I do, or to an archive, to a library. They're all real records. Obviously, I have to fictionalise uh, aspects of it and perhaps the content, but the the process and uh, and everything is is real. As the books have gone on as well, I've kind of put more and more real history in as, as well. So real historical events, and uh, there are some real people in there as well. So how did you learn to do genealogy research? And when you're talking about genealogy in the books, do you ever kind of get stage fright and go, oh my God, I better re- make sure that this is right <laughs> because otherwise, you know what genealogists are like. Every single one of them is going to tell yeah. you that one comma that you did wrong that changed the meaning yeah. of the sentence. Like lots of people, really, I, it's kind of self-taught. I, I started very loosely, I say started, uh, when I was about 12. And the way lots of lots of us do, just having a, this interest in, in family history and but I kept that, but kept that up as a kind of as a hobby. And I remember I was about 14 years old, and I interviewed lots of family members, but in particular my great great aunt Elsie, who was she was born in 1895. So there was this wonderful Victorian lady that I was interviewing, asking questions about family and things. And over the years, that's obviously as I grew up and was able to spend my money on certificates and uh, and things and going to visit archives and repositories just learned more and more along the way to answer your second question yeah I, I definitely need to stay on top of the genealogical research aspect in particular in the last couple of years with genetic genealogy and so I, I yeah possibly there's a possibility of stage fright I do I'm writing things and I'm thinking is this correct? Am I? And so I, I'm very often reaching out to Blaine Bessinger or Judy Russell and various people who are, are in the industry. And I say, am I right in, in saying this? And I, I contact people like Johnny Pearl from DNA Painter. And I'm saying, is this, am I saying this correctly? Is this, because you, you're right. People, you know, I, I, like, I want it to be, to be right. And people do very quickly comment and say, actually, <laughs> you can't do it like that. That's not possible. So I, I spend a lot of time doing the research myself, really trying to get it right. Um, and then I have people just check, checking to make sure I haven't uh, said something incorrectly. Do you have specific resources? I know you, you mentioned a number of people, you know, like Blaine Bettinger and, and Judy Russell and Johnny Pearl. Do you monitor certain uh, social media sites as resources just to stay up to date with what is happening or changing in the UK or or what becomes available. Like here in the US, Family Search is constantly releasing new records all the time and it's a big effort all the time to keep up with the changes, but it's important because there could be new things available that we might need. So what do you have a system in place or do you just rely on social media? What do you do? So um, I get very regular emails from the usual companies to, to talk about their record releases, like Ancestry and Find My Path and My Heritage. Um, I also have a regular email from the Society of Genealogists in, in this country and the National Archives, various Facebook groups. So as they come in to me, I think, oh, that, that could be of interest, you know, and I, I very often make notes or uh, forward 
the email or whatever it is to back to myself to then file it away so that when it comes to writing a book in the future um, I can think oh there, I, I had an email about that and I know that record's out there but generally when I then start a book I will make sure that the record I need is there or try to figure out what it is I'm I'm trying to say in the book to then see if the records are there, documents are there to fit it. So yeah, kind of it's it's comes in piecemeal, but but very regular. Where's the intersection of thematic inspiration, like the plot of your story, and then sort of genealogy inspiration? Like you might see something cool, like DNA painter, and say, oh, I want to somehow figure that into my book. How do you weave what you're passionate about with genealogy into what you're passionate about creating as a, a story and a plot. Yeah, it's quite it's quite a delicate juggling act, really, between those things and trying to just tell a good story as well and not to get too bogged down in the genealogy because some aspects of it, as we all know, we can sit in a, an archive or library for hours on end and actually not find anything. And that doesn't make for particularly exciting reading. So balancing those is quite tricky. I normally try and find, first of all, a story that I think there's some drama that that's an interesting story forget the genealogy for a minute but just that's a very interesting story that I want to fictionalize put my own spin on dramatize that then I start to think well how, how is this relevant obviously if it has no relevance to genealogy then it, I can't can't run with it so I'll pick a story that's got some link already and then I start to look and think I, I think I spend a good few months in the research stages so go into these archives, buying books, etc. And then I start to think, well, which websites and uh, what kind of tools and resources could Morton Farrier use? Because I don't want it to be. And then he looked on Family Search and found this record. And then he looked on Family Search and found this. I kind of want a, a balance out there that, that's realistic as well. So, you know, in my own personal genealogy, I'm going through dozens of websites and I am using DNA Painter and GEDmatch and I'm I'm using lots of different tools and, and also going to uh, archives and record offices where those records haven't been digitized or it's not to do with uh, you know genetic genealogy. So I try to have a whole range in there, but that are, are realistic. I wouldn't want somebody to read the book and say, why on earth <laughs> did, he, did he choose to do that at this point in the story when he could just have taken a DNA test and that would have given him the answer. So yeah, it's a bit of a, a juggling act, but one I, I hope I get right. With genealogy and the way you're presenting it in your stories, and your 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 stories are going back and forth between the pe present and the past, it, it's kind of like a time capsule, your story. So especially in the present, you're reflecting now. How much thought do you give to what you're talking about dating the story? Have you ever thought about like talking about ancestry or Jed match or something, and then maybe those sites go away in 10 years' time? And do you ever worry yeah. about the impact that those will have on your books? Yeah, so um, when I started, the first book was released and was set in 2013. And, and as you said, so it's basically I have two chapters in the present day, and then it goes two chapters roughly in the past, and the past changes with each book. But the present day part, I kind of, I don't remember at the time making a conscious decision, but I did put the date in. I said, this is 2013, it's in the book. Other authors in this genre don't always do that. They, they say present day. So you pick up the book and it's as if it's the present day. But I'm so glad I did that with the first book, because then with the second book, I said, this is set in 2014, the, mo the modern part. And the third one is 2015 and so on. And so I'm really glad I did that because I think if I had said present day for the first book set in 2013, people would have read it and said, I don't understand why he's not taking a DNA test. I don't understand why he's not using these websites and tools that are online now if it's in the present day. Whereas I think someone, if they pick up the first book today, they read it 2013, they'll understand that in Britain, commercial DNA testing wasn't available then. So it wasn't a possibility. So I'm, I'm very glad that, uh, that I've done that and I, I've maintained that. So the most recent book is was set last October. And so all those records, websites, et cetera, they're current at that point. So I would hope that if in 10 years time, someone came along and said, what is this website? Oh, it's gone, you know, it's gone out of business since then. So I kind of hope I've covered 
uh, inadvertently covered my back in that respect that what the records that are there are when the book is set yeah I think it's a really good idea that you do that because I mean even if you leave genealogy alone just like with cell phones the technology is changing like every year. Mm -hmm. There's no possible way. Everything is dated that uses anything current these days because of how quickly things change. So since you are self-published, how do you handle things that a publisher would normally take care of, like editing and proofing and distribution and publicity? So it's kind of a, a split thing there. So with the editing and the proofreading side of things, so I will go through it probably five times when I've finished. But even then, you know, when, when the books are kind of averaging 100,000 words a piece, I just, I can't, <laughs> I can't see the wood for the tree sometimes. And so I will get to the fifth time and I'll see, oh, there's a word missing there that I hadn't seen the previous four occasions. So once I've done with it, it goes over to uh, my husband, Robert, and he reads it through and he's uh, got a linguistics uh, background as so he goes through and, and finds things. Then it comes back to me, and then I go through it again a couple of times. When I'm kind of thinking it's it's good, then it goes to about it's about ten to twelve advanced readers, and they have it. And so I say to them, "Can you look for you know typos, uh, words missing? Can you look at anything that doesn't make sense? Does the story make sense?" They're a mixture of British, American, Australian people some of them are very into their genealogy some are not so much and so I have a good balance there of people offering their opinions because I want it to make sense if you're not a genealogist I want it to make sense if you are etc so when they're all happy then the book comes back to me and I go through it again <laughs> a couple of times then Robert will have it again and finally it's back to me again by this point by the final time through there shouldn't be I shouldn't be finding uh, any mistakes and then it goes through the, the release process with regard to the part after that, so we set up, uh, Robert and I set up a company in 2016, I think it was, 2017, basically to deal with this. So uh, he was also a teacher and stopped working in teaching to focus on the company. So all the marketing and promotion side, it basically was getting too much for, for me to do and to do writing and all the rest of the admin and emails, et cetera. He deals with all the marketing and Facebook and the, the, the boring stuff. <laughs> so how did you guys figure out which genealogists would be interested in mystery books? And from what you just said, you're looking at Americans, Australians, probably mm -hmm. Canadians, a British market. Yep. How did you figure out how to reach them to let them know that your book existed? So we do lots of work that's general within Facebook advertising and with Amazon sponsored links and things, which obviously we're targeting uh, readers and people that are using those sites who have genealogy as, as an interest. But more specifically, what I found has helped a lot since day one is that when a book's released, I will contact various people in the industry, people who have podcasts, newsletters, etc., and also genealogical societies completely around the world, admittedly uh, the US dominates. And I would basically say to them, would you like a free copy of my latest book in return for an honest review? You know, and obviously <laughs> I'm hoping that it's going to be a favourable review. So far, again, they, they have been. That basically puts uh, the books directly into my target audience's lap. It might be a very big podcast. It might be a newsletter that goes out, like, for example, Lost Cousins, uh, in, that mainly goes out to UK people, but it's 65,000 people that get told, that are genealogists, that get told, there's a new book out. I really liked it. Here's where to get it. Or it could be a very small genealogical society in America that have only got, you know, 100 uh, readers, but they're also told about it. And that I find is probably the most effective way of getting the, the books out there. I know that it's Robert who's doing the marketing, so it's not fair to ask you these questions, but do you keep track of which efforts are the most effective for you? Like, do you say you send out 20 books? Do you keep track of how effective each one of those has been? We try. It's very difficult because when I send the books out, so I think I've got about 220 people in the database now of that are either people in the industry or are 
societies. Sometimes they'll read it straight away and they'll review it in the next quarterly magazine uh, or the next newsletter. But other times they say, they will say yes, but we're very you know busy at the moment and the journal's just gone to print, so it's not going to be another for another six months. So it's it's very hard to track when those books are going to be reviewed and going to kind of hit the readers. So it's quite difficult. Things like Facebook advertising and um, Amazon, it's a bit more a bit more obvious that they give you the statistics of how an advert has performed, you know, that it's got this many click-throughs, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, really. But I do think sometimes when, when I know a newsletter has gone out, because I've received it myself with a, a book review in it, you can then see a spike in sales um, afterwards. It's interesting. It's almost like you have to put these 220 reviewers into different tiers as to like when their review might hit. You know, mm-hmm. like yeah. like you can put the bloggers and the in the first tier because they're probably going to get it out quickly, and you could put the podcasters in the second tier because they're probably going to they might have a little bit of a delay, but podcasters like to be really timely so that probably don't have a huge delay and then you know print media I imagine would be the worst you know that could be the six month to a year sort of thing and of course you don't want to wait a year (laughs) for a review so (laughs) uh, exactly yes it's a very very mixed there because some some's easy to track and some just it completely isn't you know I've had very recently I've had somebody send through their society journal with a book review and it was actually not the most recent one, but the one that came out in 2018. But that's fine if people, you know, they then go, oh, that sounds good. I'm going to go and read it. Then hopefully they'll then move on to the next one, you know? So I can't complain. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as long as they discover your works and then they they take a stab at it and you've got eight mysteries, not including your online book, eight Morton Ferrier anyways. Now you do have that other... Well, I'm forgetting the name right now. I should let me see if I have your website up. It's a it's a female detective, and I haven't read that one. What so what was that all about? That one's called Ghost Swift Blue Poppies and the Red Star. Basically, that came out on the hundred centenary anniversary of the um, end of the First World War, so it came out in November 2018. There's not much genealogy in it. It's a historical fiction, and it's something that I was just really driven to to write I felt I really wanted to write it basically it's somebody who I found in my family tree she was called Harriet McDougall and I was just really taken with her I had this photo of her when she was about 14 15 years old and she was leading what seemed like a you know a really lovely life and um, she had three sons and all three went off to war uh, but two of them were were killed in, in within just a few months of each other leaving the, the, just the third son. And I just thought, I know that happened to quite, quite a few families. And it just struck me. I just thought, I wonder how she coped with that, how she dealt with that, and what life was like for her. And very soon after the war ended, her husband then died. And I, so I basically wanted to write a story that is kind of an imagination of Harriet McDougall. So it's set just after the First World War, when her third son comes home safely and she with his help kind of sets about trying to find out what happened to one of her sons like how he died where he died what were the specifics of uh, what happened so she's traveling over to Belgium and France and she's uh, trying to uncover uh, what happened so she's it's kind of detective-y and the idea uh, was that I was going to write a second book kind of starting about now really that I would start writing and researching but Obviously, with coronavirus, I can't travel to Europe to do the research, so she's on hold for the moment. Something just about her just drew drew me to her, really, and um, I I will be writing uh, more in that series as well. Interesting. So you do plan to keep going beyond the second book even, maybe? Yes, I've got got plenty of ideas, and kind of the, the thing would be really that she would help other people to find out what happened to to their sons, husbands, etc., people who were killed or who disappeared. It's such a, it just a, it just fascinates me. And the more I did the research into the, this kind of post-war era, it's just it's just very fascinating. I just thought, obviously, I don't know exactly how she behaved afterwards and uh, you know how she was. So it's kind of an imagination of her, but details of where she lived and how old she was and uh, the, her 
some military careers, they were all real, so based on real historical and genealogical records. So do you feel like you needed to take a little break from Morton Ferrier? Do you you feel like Mort is jealous that you're spending time with this new character and not focused on him? <laughs> I love Mort, and I, I, I kind of, I, I think I'll only ever write things that I want to write. So I always come back to to Mort, and I just really like writing him. He's so, he's an easy character to to write. I feel like I know him like you know like a brother now, and I know what he would think and what what records he would go to and how he'd approach something. So I've got probably another at least three more book ideas, very, very uh, roughly sketched out. The same with Harriet, I've got several ideas, but at the moment I'm actually working on a new, another uh, new character. And this is again set in the modern day and it's based in America and it's genetic genealogy, solving um, cold case murders. To me, this is what it sounds like, that you have gained a certain confidence level and comfort level that's allowing you to really just explore and you're not afraid to to go out and try these new characters and these new avenues yeah exactly exactly that i just i i i like I said, I, something that i it's like a, a burning thing in me that i just have to do these these things and i i'm very fortunate that i don't write anything because i've been contracted to do it or I feel I ought to do it or you know I, I better do it because people are waiting I want to do the books I want to do and I hope that that my own passion then comes through it for the for the readers as well so I've got I will keep coming back to Morton but I will also in between explore other areas as well so yeah I'm very fortunate in that way. Do you have any friends who are traditionally published because you're self-published I imagine you don't have the experience of working with a traditional publisher. And I'm wondering if you have any friends where you kind of like swap stories, where you give each other the viewpoint of of what it's like, the benefits and the, the drawbacks of, of either side. Yes, yeah, I do. I've got a few friends, actually, who have been traditionally published. And I have to say their stories are why I didn't even consider going down the traditional route so when I finished hiding the past the, the first book and I was ready to put it out there I didn't even consider it I, d- I don't know if all, all my basically all my friends who have been and several of them they've just had not very good experiences with it mainly financially I have to say you know they it seems like a good deal at first that they've got this money up front but then because they're a relatively unknown writer these uh, publishing houses just don't spend their marketing budgets on them and so then they then say well your book didn't perform very well so uh, we're not going to get you to write a second or you're not going to get very well compensated and most of them have had to work in different areas not in writing that they would like to do I mean I did have before I started uh, with the fiction I did a a couple of non-fiction books which were traditionally published it's slightly different because it's localized and, and specialist and the first one was a fine experience but the second one I just I really didn't enjoy it at all I didn't enjoy it so it would take a, a very 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 big paycheck for me to even consider going with a traditional publisher I'm afraid. So what is it that you love the most about being self-published is it the editorial control I know as a podcaster the thing I love the most about having my own podcast is that nobody can tell me who to interview or what to talk about. That's why I do what I do, because I like that freedom. What is it that you love the most about self-publishing? I think it, it, it's the same thing. It's that creative freedom. I decide what I want to write, when I want to write it. I decide how long the book needs to be. I decide what the cover's going to look like. I decide when it comes out. I decide my own schedule. So if I want to take a week off or if I don't want to release that book this year, actually, or if it's suddenly done sooner, I can release it sooner. I get to choose who narrates the audiobooks. I just don't have to ask anybody anything. Like I've said, I just write what I want to write and I hope that that that's appealing to readers. And luckily for me, it it has been. So yeah, it's it's the complete freedom, not having to have my work completely changed in the edit like uh, some of my friends have had you know they've gone to their publisher and said here's here's my book and they've said yes but we're going to completely change it so that it's not really recognizable yours anymore 
It's really different earning a living as a genealogy mystery writer than it is earning a living as a, as a client researcher or as a teacher. Clearly, mm-hmm. you're doing something right because both you and Robert are doing this full time. How do you budget? Because money doesn't come in the same when you're writing books as it does when you're getting a paycheck every couple of weeks or every month. Yeah, it's uh, it's very um, it's very different. So Amazon basically the the money the royalties come in two months uh, in arrears, and every single month it's different different amount. It could be like I said that someone's promoted the books for me, and suddenly there's a spike in sales, and so two months later you'll see a spike in royalties. So it's it's very difficult. And it's, for example, the last book that I wrote in the series, The Sterling Affair. It ended up being, I thought it'd be around 100,000 words, and so therefore it would have been out kind of before Christmas last year, maybe November, maybe even October was actually my original aim. So therefore I'd have the money just after Christmas for this new book. But actually it ended up, the book was still going and still going, and it got longer and longer and ended up actually at about 140,000 words. So it wasn't released until I think January this year. And so obviously then I didn't get any money from that until until March and so you're kind of relying then on the rest of the series and people keep working their way through and it's quite hard so yeah we do have to we do have to budget and when the when you get the the high months you know kind of try and squirrel some of that away knowing that it kind of does tail off a little bit before the next book comes out or the next promotion you know so it it can can be quite can be quite a a challenge and but there's always credit cards (laughs) How much do you have to think about these sort of external practical matters? Like you you just described there how it went from 100,000 to 140,000 words. Now, in my mind, that means more pages in the book. And so that must impact the cost of the publication. So there are like all these practical little things like that. And then and the practical things like exactly what you described, like you wanted to you know, published November, December, so you'd have the money for right after Christmas, but then that didn't happen. Do you spend time thinking about that? Or does Robert spend time thinking about that? Or do you neither or do neither of you spend time thinking about that? <laughs> uh, he spends half of his life worrying about that kind of thing. I, I don't really I try not to worry about it, because I think I can't do any better than I'm doing. You know, if I, I could have, if I just, well, I couldn't, I couldn't have finished the Sterling Affair because just because I got to 100,000 words or 110, like it just needed to go, and that would just have to take as long as it takes to make the product right. That so if it needed another two months, then so be it. It just needs to be to be right. How important is an appearance at a conference, and what is the importance of participating at a conference? Because is it visibility? Is it building loyalty with your readers so that? they can meet you in person? Is it selling books to bring in, you know, the cash flow? What is it about a conference that's important? Kind of a mixture of all of those things. So for, we, this is the third year now, 2020, of attending Root Tech. Um, I also do attend various conferences on, on a smaller scale in, in the UK. Generally speaking, they are loss leaders. You know, they don't actually make money even though I have a booth and I'm selling the books generally the cost of getting to them even the ones in the UK getting the booth hotels accommodation the stock etc so generally they're kind of they break even at at best so I don't do them actually for the financial side of it the real reason the main reason I suppose is to, to meet people and to say to have an opportunity to talk to the readers and for them that some of them want uh, me to sign their book some of them want the picture and it's also the networking opportunities so every year I've met other people in the industry you know like you say I met I met you you this year I've met other people in, in previous years people that I would just wouldn't otherwise come into contact with who are in the industry who I can put faces to names and you know kind of get to know a bit better so it's kind of a, a mixture of all, all different things and for some some of the time I try to go to um actually attend the, you know the classes and and take part in the, the genealogy the reason that uh, that everybody's there but it is quite hard when I'm stuck in the booth for for the most part 
I've never actually, I've been to Rootsuk twice and I've never attended a single class. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I did a couple of breakfast ones. That was all I can manage because as soon as that expo hall opened at nine o'clock, I've got to be there. <laughs> now you mentioned about Amazon and that they have a two month pay cycle. How mm. does it work with Amazon? Because they are both your publisher, so to speak, and your distribution uh, so that so there's like two different parts do you distribute books anywhere else besides just amazon so yes so i have them on my website there for sale they can be purchased signed etc you can go into any major bookstore in the u.s for example barnes and noble you can go in and uh, order the books and same in, in the uk and other other countries as well um but Amazon is basically the, the main distribution area, yeah. Are they the ones who are distributing the books to Barnes & Noble? And is it an agreement between Barnes & Noble and Amazon that makes that availability happen? Yeah, it's quite, a complicate, it's quite a complicated one, really, because so for bookstores in the UK, like we've got a big one called Waterstones and WH Smith, basically they will place an order with an intermediary company who we supply so they will some a customer walk into waterstones and they will place an order and they go contact this intermediary company it's very um a very complicated process and seems a bit too long for my thinking but anyway and we then send them the book who then send it on to waterstones to the customer but in the us i think that barnes and noble go i just i don't really know to be honest i think that they go directly to amazon so it's nothing to do with me so if someone walks into barnes and noble in the us and orders a book, they'll get it. And it's, I don't have anything to do with it personally, or, or the business doesn't have anything to do with it. So you don't have any books physically in bookstores like Waterstones or Barnes & Noble? Somebody would have to go in and request it to be ordered? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, they're not. I think there might be, it's very hard with us as well, because Amazon don't tell us exactly who they're shipping to. So they'll just say, on this day, you sold 60 paperbacks. And we can tell that there are commercial outlets purchasing them, but they won't tell us who they are, presumably in case we somehow manage to uh, undercut them. So I don't really know how that happens, but I think Barnes & Noble, so they may be in, in bookstores. I don't actually know what happens to them. I don't know. Basically, there's at least one big order per month that goes to the US that I don't know who they are or if they're all orders that are being sent around the country to various stores or if they're on, on bookshelves. But as far as I'm aware, they need to be ordered rather than just walk in and get them. And what about the fact that your audience is in all these different countries? How does that impact? Like if I were to order a book, now I bought a book at the conference, so that was easy. But <laughs> if I were to go right now and I go up to Amazon, is it coming to me through Amazon US or from Amazon UK? And does that impact the cost of the book you know like with shipping and, and such so you would be getting so there's uh, us would be supplying you with your book and it's just i think they're all standard pricing so you won't you wouldn't pay any extra basically okay. for my book than you would for, for any other book it's print they're printed uh, on demand so there's a printing plant i suppose you want to say uh, in america so um okay. if you place your order today for a book it will be with you within a couple of days, printed in the US, sent from the US to you. Um, there's also a printed plant in the UK, one in Canada, and I think there's one in for some of the European uh, countries as well. It kind of depends, but uh, for the US and for the UK, certainly, it's very quick turnaround, so you should have it within a couple of days. One last question about the Amazon thing. So as part of the contract that they are terms of service, whatever it is they, they have with you, it sounds like they prevent you from contacting other booksellers directly when you're with them? Yeah, you're, you're not really supposed to. I mean, I could contact them, but I, basically I'm not really supposed to sell directly to them. I'm perfectly okay, allowed to order author copies at a reduced rate, which I then, they're the ones that I will send out to people when a new book is out or if I'm attending a UK conference I will actually take those physical copies with me but I don't believe that I should really be you know going to Waterstones or Barnes and Noble and saying hey do you want to buy the books 
uh, cheaper from me. I don't, I don't think I'm allowed. I haven't tried. So. Right, right. Okay, I've got two more questions before we head into the lightning round. One question is, talk to me about Morton in lockdown. So we're experiencing coronavirus and we're, we're all actually in lockdown more or less right now in, what is this, July 2020. And what made you decide to create Morton in lockdown? Yeah, so I was, before uh, coronavirus, I was I started this book that I, that I said earlier that I, I'm writing now about this genetic genealogy cold case thing. And then um, when it came to lockdown, I suddenly, very early on, like as soon as we basically went into lockdown, you can't go out, you can't, you know, I thought, oh, I just, I, <laughs> I got this burning thing in me again that I, that I get that I should be writing something to do with, with Morton to say what he's doing because I was hearing so many people from around the world all experiencing the same thing that, you know, you're <laughs> eating too much, you're unnecessarily baking, you can't get hold of toilet roll, your moods go up and down and I was thinking, you know, it be quite, quite, could be quite funny and, and quite interesting to kind of document what Morton Farrier's doing and for him to solve a mini case from home obviously he can't go to the national archives he can't go to the libraries he can't visit people so it's all what what can he do from home and I kind of thought as well I wanted to get this out quite quickly so I thought it's and it'll be quite short so it won't be coming out in paperback and I thought well I quite fancy doing something different so I, I came up with this idea of doing a web-based story kind of like those I don't know if you had them uh, in the US but in, in, when I was younger we used to read these choose your own adventures so you'd read a chapter and at the end it would say if you want to go and uh, fight the dragon turn to page 82 and if you want to go to go get some food go to page 24 and so you'd be flipping around making these choices and I thought I'd quite like to offer the reader a chance to dictate and direct where the, the story is going and so I started to explore it a bit and thinking I'd quite like the story to have some kind of parallel as well with the uh, 1918 uh, Spanish flu. So I was thinking, what story could I come up with that had a, a kind of a link to that? And so I, I came up with the story, a bit of uh, First World War in there as well, and the case and how it would evolve. I started to explore various uh, ways of doing this choose your own style story. And uh, yeah, the, the, and the reception has been re really amazing. So I did ma manage to get it out. I don't even know when I released it now, four weeks ago. You're offering this for free as well, aren't you? Yeah, so I kind of thought, well, I, first of all, I don't really know how to price it because you could read the story from beginning to end without taking loads of deviations and going back. You could read the story quite quickly. And I thought if, if someone just reads it from beginning to end, like a traditional story, then if I start to say, well, that's two pounds, three pounds, they might say, well, that's a bit overpriced because, you know, I've, I've read it in an hour, two hours. And then I thought also lots of people are being affected, you know, during this time and people haven't got the money to just go, you know, they're losing their businesses or they're furloughed. They're not going to be wanting really to be splashing out on um, an, a story. So I thought, well, it's free, but if people are able to contribute, towards it and wish to contribute towards it there's basically options like paypal options on there to contribute to it and lots of people yeah very very kindly have and have really enjoyed the story and kind of thinking how would they tackle this case and also some of them are thinking how would morton tackle this case and and there's a few little um bits and pieces in there about previous stories for example there's something that goes on in the sterling affair the, the last book and uh, basically one of the baddies, there's a picture of him in there and a bit more information. So they're kind of bits and pieces hidden around in, in, within the story. And I mean that I did it. It's just one of those things that I get <laughs> inside me, this burning, you've got to do this. So I, yeah, I put this cold case book to one side, just concentrated on that. I, yeah, it's quite a, a document really of the times, you know, he, he does struggle to get hold of toilet roll and is baking unnecessary and uh, unnecessarily and... Um, kind of feeling what most of us are feeling really I love that you're experimenting like that and I just I think it it, it just shows how in groove and in sync you are with your own writing and you're in total control of your career right now you know for you to just be able to to experiment like this and to change and to see what resonates I think it's great yeah it was really it was a really good experience actually and 
people, the, the feedback from people that read it, they quite liked as well the fact that I was able to put, like I've never done before, the, uh, put photographs in there and actual links to actual documents online, you know, and websites that Morton is using. I can actually link to it. So you can just click when he says he's going to go to the National Archives to download this digital document. You can click the link and you can go and download that digital document, the exact one he's just he's just done. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed doing it. It was a challenge. I have to say it stretched my brain when I keep offering two or three options and then those options have two or three options. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one last totally random question. One of the things that uh, genealogy professionals struggle with is websites. I think it's the the number one thing <laughs> that nobody really wants to do. So they either mm -hmm. they do it themselves and they they do it well because they have some skills or they do it very poorly because they don't and they don't really want to do it or they hire somebody and that's less frequent. Uh, so I noticed mm -hmm. that your website is on the Wix platform. So yeah. I want to know, how did you decide to go to Wix and how do you update your website? Is it you or Robert or do you, did you farm that to an outside person? I've had a website for quite a while and my old, my old original one was very out, out of date and it was in the days of uh, Microsoft front page. So it was doing file transfer protocol and it was very clunky, very out of date and I just couldn't update it. So about, I don't know when it was, three or four years ago, I thought I need a new website and I looked around and I did lots of research. I contacted companies and, and I ended up going to Wix because of their uh, very easy to understand and easily navigable interfaces that are very user friendly. And I basically downloaded one of their templates and started to customize it and play around. I, I kind of almost went with another company, you know, like you do it, you design it, you do it, and I'll give you the bits to update as time goes on. But I thought I needed more control over that and needed to be able to update it regularly and not pay somebody out this fee. And so I went with Wix. I've, I've been I've been very happy with it, I have to say, and it's, it is very user friendly. And I would say, if you're not confident with web design, then try Wix and try their templates because you don't have to be. It's very very intuitive. There's no you don't have to use any HTML coding. If you want to add a photo, you click a plus button and you go add photo, and then you go and drag and drop your photo in the, in the normal way you would in other in other programs add text, et cetera. You can put videos on there and it can be as dynamic as you wish. Mine's got a shop on it and, you know, it's hosting this Morton lockdown story. It's got about 60 odd pages on there, some video links to YouTube, all my social media. So I, I would recommend if, if people are thinking, oh, I need to do a website. I don't, I'm not very confident. If you've got basic computer skills, then I would go with Wix. I would very much recommend it. All right, Nathan. It is time to enter the lightning round. This is the time of the episode when I ask you a bunch of quick questions. And they're on topics that are usually helpful to our listening audience. And are you ready to get started? I am. Okay. What was the one thing you were most afraid of, and in, in your case, let's say, in, in going full time with your writing business? So it definitely was uh, the money side of things, yeah. Just not having enough to to pay the mortgage. So it was a, it was a risk, but it it paid off. What's the best advice you've received from someone else? So that's kind of a combination of Robert saying to me, "Get on with it. You've got a good story. Get 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 it out there." And uh, the author Steve Robinson, who said there is a, a genre out there, <laughs> get on and write it. So uh, yeah, the advice was right. Get on, do it. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy mystery writing career? <laughs> so it would be to take baby steps towards it. If I hadn't taken those little steps to begin in, I would still be teaching and saying, oh, one day I'm going to write a book or one day I'm going to finish that book. It's just those little steps, even if you don't know where it's going to go, just start to do something. And if it's specifically writing related, then it's write something. And it doesn't matter if it's rubbish. It doesn't matter if it's 200 words. Just write something and let it build, let it grow. Throw it away if it's, if it's no good at the end and then write something else. But take, take a baby step 
towards it. You're not you. Most people can't jump to a full time writing career just oh tomorrow I'll do that. It just doesn't happen like that. You need to take little steps. So take that first one. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? And it can be anything. It doesn't have to be related to genealogy or writing or anything. Well, obviously, it would be all of mine. But uh, no, really, um, it probably would be, for me, the thing that at the moment is Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genealogy by Blaine Bettinger. It's really, if you're at all in, into genealogy at the moment, I think it needs to be involving genetic genealogy. And that's a very good book at explaining everything. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. I would say, yeah, just keep on top of uh, your game. So if you're wanting to get into a writing career, I would say write about something you're passionate about, like genealogy, if that's what you want to do, then really get on top of what's out there now. So uh, it's very, you're very up to date with everything and take that, that first step contact me the best way is probably to go to my website which is www.nathandillongoodwin.com um, and on there you've got links to uh, all the social media things to i'm on facebook twitter instagram pinterest uh, linkedin youtube so all the links are, uh, are on my website nathan dylan goodwin thank you so much for being on the genealogy professional podcast thank you for having me it's been great fun When people think of a genealogy career, they first think of a genealogy researcher, someone who does paid genealogy research for a client. I hope you've been discovering across all the episodes of this podcast that while that is true, there are many ways to satisfy your genealogy itch and earn a living at it. Nathan Dillon Goodwin, who loves to write and loves genealogy, proved that you can combine the two. Whether you want to become a genealogy mystery writer or not, I hope you picked up some tips today. Many genealogists end up writing books of one sort or another. Nathan shared tips for getting your book written, as well as how to ease into a writing career. He also shared how to get your book into the hands of your desired audience and the difference between self-publishing and a traditional publisher. In news this week, as I mentioned last time, if you'd like to contribute to supporting the podcast, then I would ask, if it's possible, that you recommend me as a virtual speaker to your local library, or historical or genealogical society. Any money earned from speaking now goes directly to supporting the podcast. You can find more details about this in the show notes at thegenealogyprofessional.com. If you want to connect with me, join me on Facebook in the TGP Action Group. You can comment, share your expertise, and ask questions. Search for the TGP Action Group on Facebook or find the URL in the show notes. If you're not on Facebook follow the Genealogy Professional on LinkedIn. You can get new episode notices there. Go to LinkedIn and search for the Genealogy Professional and hit the follow button. In addition to the podcast on Spotify and YouTube, you can now also find it in Google Play and all other Google products. For instance, you can search the Genealogy Professional podcast without an app, just right in the Google search box, and the results will deliver the latest podcast episodes right there in the search results. All you have to do is click play. That's it for this time. Until we meet again, keep improving your business skills and take at least one step to push your business forward. The Genealogy Professional Podcast is a production of Fieldstone Common Media. Copyright 2020. Executive Producer, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Creative Producer, George Edwards. Technical Director, Jean-Luc Pierre-Louis, Jr.